as they do their daily chores, basically, or daily business. I think this is key, actually, because um, if you focus on a needs-first approach, in some cases, it might be quite a simple technology solution. Yeah. In other cases, perhaps a much more elaborate one. But if you, if you pair it back to needs first, then that's, yeah. rather than going technology first, perhaps, you have, maybe have a more effective end product at the end. Absolutely. And that's where the, also the private sector comes in, because as, as the government starts to put in place the right yeah. building blocks and share the responsibility, yeah. I think innovation in the private sector is a lot more, you know, yeah. it's, it's faster. Yeah. The, the private sector can innovate, come up with new ideas, new services, new applications a lot faster than the government normally. And so that, that sharing of responsibility comes into play when you need to deliver a better experience to... to uh, exactly, because I guess people would look at this as almost like old school anthropology, studying how people actually behave when they're meeting a service in their day-to-day -day life. You know, marketing departments have done this for many, many years, but governments are only starting to do it, I guess, really in the last five, five to six years. Absolutely. Yeah. Suleiman, we're discussing technology now. Um, you are the head of ICT for the World Expo, perhaps the biggest, most flagship initiative happening in Dubai right now. Again, if you look at the happiness as the, as the end goal and the use of technology and innovation, which of course is the topic of today's event, how do you see technology through the Expo um, leading to better happiness? Okay, I will start a little bit briefing about Expo. Please. Um, as you said, World Expo, within four years and one month, we will be opening our gates to the world Expo that will be hosting more than 250 nations uh, with companies and NGOs to provide the services and to provide a future, how the future will be looking like. Putting that in our mind, the theme that we are promoting, connecting mind, creating the future. If we link the themes, creating, uh, connecting mind, creating the future, you cannot do that without the happiness and without providing innovative solutions. To give you a scale of Expo, our size of uh, Expo is almost 4.38 square kilometers, which is the size of Disneyland in California. We are expecting to have over 20 million visit visitors, which is the populations of Australia. We are looking forward to host that more than 250 uh, nations companies and to accommodate around 300 uh, visitors per day, including our staff. If you combine that all, and if you make that kind of continent happy, that will have a huge impact. How we can save, it, how we can save the innovations and to satisfy them? From ICT perspective, we have three pillars. And before starting with those pillars, uh, our general director, Her Excellency Emil Hashmi, always when she meets with me, she says, Suleiman, stop talking about technology terminology. What service you are providing? Because if you are using the latest technology or innovative ideas without serving a purpose, you are not meeting the expectations. Yeah. And here we are talking about, we have three pillars to stand how we can assist the innovations. First of all, enhance an experience of our visitors or participant or one of our stakeholders how we can enhance an experience of our visitors. Will be a simple example, how we can use the drones to attempt to a first aid incident in the site, having the three, four square kilometers aside. And not only that part, but how that drones will be connected to one of the clinics or hospitals across uh, the country. Another part, we are looking forward how we can solve a problem. Simple problems, if you think about it. Lost a child. With that kind of space, lost a child is a common. People will say the best solution to do it is just put a wearable. But how you can evolve it? We are thinking about putting a wearable which is connected using the smart side technologies to the lighting systems. So in the evening, if the child is being lost, the lighting systems in that only spot will be changed from yellow to green to identify this is the spot that the operation team and the incident to go and attend to it instead of just looking through the phone and walking around. The third part is we are looking how we can seize an opportunity. Now, technology is evolving every day. Previously, you can look to the technology that every one year, two years, a new technology comes. Now, each quarter, new technology comes. How we can seize an opportunity? How we can use the big data to enhance an experience? If somebody comes from China, 
and he doesn't speak except Chinese, how we can interact with him. And this is where we are introducing or planning to introduce something called Excepo Companion, that anybody supporting a multi-language can speak their own language and interact with digitally with our service center or with our representative. And we don't forget the special need. How we can support the special need? How we can convert the sign language to a speech, to a voice, to a text? Yep. If you satisfy those three pillars, you are providing a happiness environment for those visitors. Imagine, as I said previously, 300,000 300, as overalls, and we are talking about overall 25 million visitors across the six months. This is where we are looking from that perspective and how we can, innovations and technology could enhance a better environment. You should meet the expectations. Our ultimate goal is that when a child leaves the grade of Expo, we would love to, to hear from him, I love it. Yeah. A family member to say, oh individual, thank you. Special need or an elder people's grandfather, grandmother to tell us, God bless you. Once we reach there, we can say that we provided a happy environment for the peoples. For sure, it will be integrated with the smart base and with the different government entities because we are in tight, actually, with the smart base and working with that. That's interesting. There's a lot of overlap. So the two key words that keep coming up is, I guess, needs first approach and experience first approach. So before you think about the technologies and how exciting they are, you've got to bring it back to the needs and the, the experience. I want to jump over into the private sector part of the discussion, which is a little bit different. Um, Dr. Dahlia, GE is what we refer to in the Economist as a mega company. It's been around for a very long time. It has a huge number of employees, uh, I think more than 300,000 perhaps. It's still very much at the cutting edge of many different industry sectors. Um, and you have an initiative in, your, in GE, a way of measuring the happiness or well-being of your employees and then link to that a way of trying to boost it on a regular basis. Can you maybe just talk us through how that works, how it's gone so far, and what you've learned maybe from it? Yep, absolutely. First of all, I think there's a lot of echo on the sound, so I can't, I can't hear you guys too well. So maybe we could cut down on the echo. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities in what has been said, um, specifically around the stuff that Dr. Ali had mentioned on the importance of measuring, you know, how well are you doing? There's no point in, you know, launching new initiatives if you're not able to kind of pulse from the community on how well you've been doing. Um, and then the other thing is around instilling values for happiness. Um, and the third around, how do you recognize and celebrate people who you think champion what you're doing, right? So what we do in GE, we also have a set of GE values. Now, if we go traditionally, so historically, we've had a set of GE values that talk about, you know, how do you promote imagination, being an instigator, um, you know, being big on compliance. And then as we, you know, as we move on, we see the way the economy has been transforming, the pace of change, the, uh, you know, the, the fierce competition, the, the need to move fast and to be simple and, and, and you're quick and agile. And a company like an organization the size of GE, a big conglomerate, how do we make sure that we are you know, making it move as fast as it should so that we don't you know, lose out? We've been, we've been around for over 100 years and we want to be around in the next 100 years. So, so we then looked at our GE beliefs, uh, sorry, the GE values, and we said, you know what, let's rename those. Let's think about introducing what we call the GE beliefs. And you may, you, know, you may argue and say beliefs and values are pretty much the same thing, but really is the beliefs are kind of like the underlying principles, whereas the values are, you know, they're what they would guide your actions. So we really wanted each employee to have a sense of GE beliefs. And these beliefs are five. One of them is around you know, customers, importance of customers, the customers determine our success. The other is around moving fast, you know, speed, the third is around empowering and inspiring each other. Um, the fourth is around learning and adapting. Yep. Because at this stage, you know, you've got to continuously learn. And the fifth then is around delivering results in an, in an uncertain world. And then historically as well, we've, we also have a, a measuring tool we call the GE Opinion Survey, which we do at the end of every year. And, you know, we send it out to all of the employees across the organization. And we kind of ask them, you know, how well are we doing? Are you yep. guys you know, feeling that we really are impactful and we're doing the right changes to make you empowered to do these changes and, and you know, act faster and, and you know, cut down all of these um, uh, processes that we don't need to have, really. And then we realized that 
you know, that's not even good enough, and we need to move even faster. So we've introduced what we, called, what we call the GE Culture Compass, and this has just been launched a few months ago, actually. Um, so it's more transparent. It's more, um, we do it in over 20 languages, you know, to make sure that um, we could really access the voice of our, the voice of our employees. Um, and then, as I said, so it's, it's real time. You see, the, you see the response then and there. You can react to it faster. Um, and, you know, you're able to sense, and it's kind of like a compass, you know, where are we going and sense the direction. Given how many employees you have, the kind of the back end of all that process and what you do with all that data, how you maybe use it to make changes in your company, how is, how is that process working? Can you actually take that data and do certain things differently so, on a rolling basis? Yeah, so actually, you know, it's good you mentioned that question because I have an important um, note to say as well that GE is going through a culture transformation itself. And basically, we're, we're moving towards becoming the world's leading digital industrial company. So we've developed our own platform um, for the industrial internet. And it's kind of like the backbone and the analytics uh, and the big data that is um, the backbone of all of our industrial install base across the globe. And then, so there's, you know, from a commercial standpoint, how do we help our customers through using this platform and this, these data analytics to help them do their business or um, their operations easier, faster, and more efficient. But then also, how do we, how do we become more efficient? Yeah. And how do we use these IT capabilities mm -hmm. to do, you know, not only internal manufacturing and, um, you know, operational stuff, but also right. the backbone that is required. From to your own customer to a certain extent. Exactly. Yeah. You know, within our employees, how do we use these digital capabilities internally? Okay. So I'm conscious of time, so I want to ask Bill Al about, you sit in the middle of the private sector and the public sector to a certain extent, uh, as the arm of the American Chamber of Commerce. You have employees, we also have members. So when you think about increasing the happiness of your employees, of your, or your members, what kind of tangible initiatives can you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis that would make a, a difference or move the needle to some okay. degree? Yeah. Uh, well, if you want to talk about tangible, specific, uh, I can give you a few examples, uh, namely three. Uh, but, I mean, as, as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce office, um, I suppose our number one public-facing service is uh, providing events. Yep. So uh, chambers of commerce provide business programming, focusing on initiatives like Expo 2020, uh, cybersecurity. Uh, and then various other, you know, initiatives happening in healthcare and, and, and in other uh, areas. Um, and the U.S. Chamber, uh, our mandate and our obligation is to put on business programming. Uh, but because we represent industry and we re represent businesses, one of them GE, uh, and, and under businesses we represent over a million employees here uh, in, in the region, we very, uh, quite a while ago, uh, recognized that uh, the employee's happiness is vital. Uh, and so we took a step decades ago here in Dubai, before happiness was uh, the trend that it is today, uh, to begin introducing social programming within our business calendar. So we focus on cybersecurity one day, and we hold Fourth of July celebration for employees and the American business community. That's very important for us. And I think for the wider audience, um, we're a very unique and specialized organization, being kind of semi-government semi in, in between private sector and public sector. But for everybody in the room, what you can do is think about your number one public-facing service or, or product and, and find a way to increase your, your client's satisfaction and, and happiness via providing that service or that product. So that's what we did, and, and uh, via introducing social programming, Fourth of July celebrations and networking events, we've increased the satisfaction and happiness of, of our community. Now, secondly, um, we've, we've begun to introduce initiatives, uh, such as what we call internally the MRP. The MRP is the Membership Rewards Program. So we go out and we try to find win-win situations uh, based, on our, based on our position as a bridge and a multiplier. So we're a bridge between companies and our members. So by going to our member, you know, what do our, our members want? Uh, they want discounts, they want rewards. So we go out to companies and we say, hey, listen, you know, is there anything that you can offer to make our members happy and provide a win-win situation? In fact, just you know, as recently as, as uh, 
couple months ago when we were discussing participation at this uh, particular conference, we were also ha having this, this idea of how we can make this a win-win situation to bring greater happiness to our members. And that's when we were discussing with the organizers about why don't we bring in a member of ours, and therefore we have Dalia here uh, from GE. Uh, which is hopefully a win-win situation, and hopefully Dalia is a little bit happier than she was uh, yesterday. <laughs> One thing I wanted to ask about, you touched on in your first point, it, people stress that in a place like Dubai, where you have people coming all the time, people leaving all the time, you have a high propensity for technology. Many of us are buried in our smartphones every day. Some people don't come here with the future, live here, for, uh, remain here for, forever. When people look at what has affected well-being historically, especially during times of economic crisis, for example, or economic downturns, one of the key things everyone stresses is social capital, the bonds between people. Right. And in a place like Dubai, it can be quite challenging to build those bonds across the whole population. So in the kind of events that you have for your members, their families, and so on, are, are you finding it harder to get people to come together and build longer lasting connections? Or, or are people still up for doing that? Because there's a fear that people are becoming less and less willing mm -hmm. or interested in building these kind of human-to-human -human connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're right in, in that sense. I mean, Dubai, the very nature of Dubai and, and uh, how it brings peoples and companies together is, is very unique. Uh, it's different than the US, and that's why we've had to find a different way of operating. And that's why we have uh, established, for example, a role which is not available or not found in any other chamber of commerce around the world, or particularly in the US. Um, we've near the beginning of this year, in line with the announcement of the Minister of State for Happiness, we ourselves hired uh, a position, a director for... You know